We all know the story. We've heard it over and over, seemingly since birth for many of us. Stalin was an evil, cruel, stupid dictator who ruled over the Soviet Union with an iron fist, enforced a cult of personality, and murdered millions of people. That's pretty much how it goes. And it has to be true, right? Because that's what everyone says, even many leftists, even some communists, and you'd better not question it. But is it really true? The West, and especially the US, has a long history of strong anti-communism and anti-leftism in general. It goes all the way back to the Haymarket Affair in the 19th century, and certainly further than that. There were, of course, both of the Red Scares, the repressions that came with them, the invasion of Russia following the October Revolution, support of counter-revolutionaries in the associated civil war, McCarthyism, the Cold War, the Korean War, and the war on Vietnam, to name just a few big examples. That's not mentioning all the other attempted and successful coups, invasions, support, and installation of military dictatorships, assassinations, proxy wars, other attacks, sabotage, sponsorship of terrorism, false flags, blockades, embargoes, sanctions, election meddling, disinformation campaigns, and other interference. For a long time, Stalin was basically the popular face of communism, and to some extent, still is. The Western governments had, and have, pretty strong motivation to make him look bad. The U.S. government and media in particular have a long track record of lying when it comes to the state's foreign policy. The Gulf of Tonkin incident and supposed proof of WMDs in Iraq spring to mind. But it goes much deeper than just the government. In capitalist countries, the government simply serves the capitalist class and their interests. Socialism obviously goes against their interests, and they have an incentive to make socialist figures and projects look bad. Both labor movements in their own countries, and especially the USSR, had them scared. And of course, the capitalist class owns the vast majority of things, including the media outlets. To a large extent, they basically control what is heard or seen widely in the media. They control the narrative. And their influence extends far beyond the mainstream media, including its academia and education. This alone should already make one question the validity of certain narratives, but there are some good examples that drive the point home. One of them is Robert Conquest. He was a respected historian, considered a reliable source, and his books were read and cited widely. He also worked in British intelligence, and his works have largely been discredited, but they're still used and cited. I will use Fur's article written upon Conquest's death to help illustrate this case. Conquest worked at the Information Research Department, previously known as the Communist Information Bureau, from its inception in 1947 to 1956. Its main purpose was to combat communist influence around the world by planting stories among those who could influence public opinion, including politicians and journalists. In 1978, The Guardian published an article suggesting that Conquest's work there was to contribute to the black history of the USSR, i.e., to fabricate stories presented as fact that would be sent to journalists and others who could influence the public. Following his formal departure from the IRD, he kept writing books suggested by them, with support from the Secret Service. Quote, his book The Great Terror, a basic anti-communist text on the subject of the power struggle that took place in the Soviet Union in 1937, was in fact a recompilation of text he had written when working for the Secret Services, for it was finished and published with IRD help, and the Prager Press, typically associated with literature from the CIA, bought a third of the publication run. It was intended to be given to useful fools, like professors and people working in the press, radio, and TV. For anti-communist, quote, historians, he is still one of the most popular sources on the Soviet Union. Arch Getty, himself an anti-communist historian, called Conquest out in his 1979 PhD dissertation. Quote, the dominant tendency in writing the history of the purges has been automatically to believe everything an emigre asserted while automatically denying the truth of everything from the Stalinist side. If one wanted a balanced picture of Tsar Ivan IV, the terrible, one would not accept at face value the descriptions of the exiled Prince Kurbsky in Poland during a period of Russo-Polish war. 
If one wanted a balanced picture of Mao Zedong's regime in China, one would not accept Chiang Kai-shek's version in the early 1950s as essentially reliable. If one were not interested in such a view, one would. The apparent monstrosity of Stalin's crimes and a generation of Cold War attitudes have contributed to what would be considered sloppy scholarship in any other area of inquiry. He went on to say, quote, sometimes the scholarship had been more than simply careless. Recent investigations of British intelligence activities following in the wake of U.S. post-Watergate revelations suggest that Robert Conquest, author of the highly influential Great Terror, accepted payment from British intelligence agencies for consciously falsifying information about the Soviet Union. Consequently, the works of such an individual can hardly be considered valid scholarly works by his peers and the Western academic community. Conquest also straight up said rumors and hearsay were valid sources. Getty commented on this as well, saying, quote, Conquest makes the astounding statement that, quote, truth can thus only percolate in the form of hearsay. And further, quote, on political matters, basically the best, though not infallible, source is rumor. He believes that the best way to check rumors is to compare them with other rumors, a dubious procedure given the fact that immigrants read each other's works. Of course, historians do not accept hearsay and rumor as evidence in any other field of history. Getty concluded, quote, The point of view adopted here is that the standard interpretations of the great purges, such as those by Fain Sod and Conquest, are seriously flawed, cannot account for the available evidence, and are thus no longer tenable. Robert Thurston was among the very few officially in the field of Soviet studies to confront conquest in a mainstream journal. In a 1986 article, he, for example, pointed out that the Great Terror wasn't a very honest descriptor as very few people were actually terrorized. Conquest responded with hostility. Following publication of Conquest's book Harvest of Sorrow in the 1980s, anti-communist experts rejected it universally. Quotes from some of them were included in Jeff Coplin's 1988 article, In Search of a Soviet Holocaust, A 55-Year-Old Famine Feeds the Right. Conquest eventually backpedaled on his claim that Stalin somehow deliberately caused the famine, deciding instead to claim that he could have prevented it, without real evidence. Aided by British intelligence, Conquest took lies concocted under and by Khrushchev, attached moral lies from Western anti-communists, and called it history. Quote, Conquest, the Great Terror, has lots of footnotes, which are intended to fool the educated but naive reader, Fur, But those footnotes allowed Fur to discover that he used fake evidence and never proved any of his anti-communist and anti-Stalin claims. When Gorbachev started repeating Khrushchev's lies and inventing his own, Conquest put out a new edition of the Great Terror and proclaimed, I was right. But he wasn't. Gorbachev was just telling the same kinds of lies, often the same lies, that Khrushchev and his people had told. Fur wrapped up his article by saying, in part, quote, Conquest got a lot of honors from the mass murdering imperialists, from Margaret Thatcher to Ronald Reagan and beyond. He earned their praise. He also got a cushy, high paying post at the Hoover Institution. Such are the rewards for telling lies on behalf of the anti communists. Of course, lies about Stalin didn't come just from Westerners. As Fur mentioned, they also came from Soviet figures such as Khrushchev and Gorbachev, though people in the West eagerly took advantage of this. They had their own motivations and reasons for this. Khrushchev was a revisionist who wanted to consolidate his power after Stalin's death, expel many of the loyal Marxist-Leninists, and implement his own revisionist agenda. One of the things he railed against Stalin for was the cult of personality around him, something Stalin himself opposed and spoke out against, and that Khrushchev had actually been a big supporter of in prior years. Gorbachev's motivations might be summed up by this quote of his, quote, My ambition was to liquidate communism. My ideal is the path of social democracy, i.e. welfare capitalism. Another big figure in this category is Trotsky, but I won't say too much here. I do think this quote from the beginning of First Post is pretty fitting. Quote, Robert Conquest, next to Leon Trotsky, was arguably the chief anti-communist and anti-Stalin propagandist of the 20th century. I'll try to keep this intro from dragging on, so I'll just say that the anti-Stalin paradigm has become extremely widespread everywhere, to varying degrees, but not everyone views him that way. There are also people all over the world, from the former USSR to the West and beyond, 
who do not vilify him and even admire him. But why? Could they have good reasons? Considering that the popular narrative about Stalin doesn't come from the most honest place, and that's being generous, what is his real story? Let's start from the beginning. But before we do, I should make some notes. Although there are more, these three sources were the main ones used for this project. They will often not be cited unless I pull a direct quote from one, which there are many of, because of how much they were used. Other sources will generally be cited at the relevant points. I feel they are solid, especially compared to what anti-communists typically use. Gray was an anti-communist historian, but much more honest and measured than they tend to be. Still, his book does contain some dishonest anti-communist propaganda, and I'd recommend being decently informed on the basics before reading it. Unlike Gray and Murphy's books, Martinez's is much shorter on the biography part, though it is there, and is more concerned with refuting falsehoods. It's still great, though. They're all good, and can be obtained freely online if you look in the right place. Murphy's book is even on the MIA, Marxist.org. With that out of the way, let's go.